Now that we know how to do arithmetic of functions, we will use the functions we studied in chapter 1 and see how we can do arithmetic with them. So we'll start out with using specific type of power functions, which are real number times x to power n for n whole number. Those kind of power functions, if you add, subtract, multiply together, will give us give rise to functions that are called polynomial functions. We'll look at constant functions, but we'll also look at linear functions, quadratic functions, and cubic functions. Then we will look at quotient or division of power functions or polynomial functions, and we will give rise to rational functions. When you do division or quotient of exponential functions, it will give rise to something called logistic growth functions. So let's go see what polynomial functions are all about. A polynomial function is defined as the sum of two or more power functions. And the power functions, do you remember what they were? Some constant multiplier times a variable x raised to the power whole number 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So when you take a whole bunch of power functions of those type and you add, subtract, or multiply together, what results is a polynomial function. As you know, the domain of all of these power functions that we're adding is all real numbers. And since you domain is intersection of all the individual functions, domains, when you add or subtract or multiply, the domain of polynomial functions is all real numbers. The range of polynomial functions that are odd degree, that means the highest power is an odd number, it's also all real numbers. However, when n is even, then the domain might be a little difficult. You, it's not so straightforward. You'll have to look at the graph. And we'll do examples later so you can see what the domain and range of these functions is. When n is specific numbers like 0, 1, 2, and 3, we give them some special names. So when you have a power 0, which means it's a constant term, then you call that a constant function, which means for every input, the output is a fixed number, which gives you a rise to horizontal line in terms of its graph. A linear function is when you have a constant function plus some constant times x. Perhaps you may have seen it as y equals mx plus b. The coefficient of x here, the m, is non-zero and is referred to as the slope of the line or rate of change or average rate of change. And b is called the y-intercept. A quadratic function is a polynomial of degree 2. So it'd be like some constant plus some constant times x plus some constant times x squared. You may have seen it as ax squared plus bx plus c, and we call it a quadratic function or a polynomial function of degree 2. And a, b, and c are called its coefficients. The graph of this function are called parabolas. We will see those in detail a little bit later. A polynomial of degree 3. So some constant plus constant times x plus constant times x squared plus constant times x cubed is called a cubic function. In general, if you think about a power function of the polynomial function, then you know that when you raise really large numbers to, say, x to power 4 or 5 or n, those terms are so big that they dominate the entire polynomial. And so the n behavior of a polynomial function is dominated by its highest degree term, a sub n, x to power n. And so when you want to look what happens to the function as x goes to plus or minus infinity, all you have to do is look at the highest degree term and see what the n behavior of that power function is. So basically, if you have an even powered highest degree term, the two ends are either up, up, or down, down. Or if you have an odd function, then left hand could be up, right hand could be down, or left hand down, right hand up, 
It depends on the degree of the polynomial. We'll work on this a little more a little bit later. So polynomial functions are used in STEM majors, business majors, nursing majors. For example, in physics, a trajectory of any object thrown in air can be modeled by a second degree polynomial. In business, for example, if you were selling t-shirts, let's say $5 a t-shirt, then the $5 is the price, and x is the number of t-shirts you sold, so 5 times x would be the revenue. That would be a polynomial function. But if the price is, for example, not a constant but a linear, then times x will make it a quadratic function. If your price function is a quadratic function, then multiplying by x will make it a cubic function. So polynomial functions occur in many different majors. When you do division of polynomial functions, you end up with something called a rational function. So a rational function is one polynomial divided by another polynomial. But it's very important to remember that here the domain is affected by the denominator. So the domain of the rational function, p of x over q of x, is given by all real numbers x for which the denominator function is non-zero. And we'll spend a little more time on rational functions a little later. So here's an example of a rational function. 2x plus 3 over x squared plus 2x minus 3. The denominator factors as x plus 3 and x minus 1. So you can automatically see we cannot have x equals 1 or negative 3. So the domain of this function would be all real numbers except negative 3 and 1. In interval notation, that would be negative infinity to negative 3, negative 3 to 1, and then 1 to infinity. We can always write when you have polynomial functions division like that. If you remember division from your prerequisite materials, you will know we can write it as quotient plus remainder over divisor. The reason this is important is because then we can see that the n behavior of the function is going to always be dictated by the quotient function. And the remainder will always have a degree smaller than denominator degree. So for n behavior, when x is very large, then the number, the remainder over the divisor q of x, is always going to go to 0, and that's why the n behavior is dictated by the quotient of this division. There are many applications for rational functions. For example, you see here the rectangle. It has a fixed area of a. But when you have a fixed area, you can make the width and height any number you want as long as their product is the area, right? Because length times width is area. So if the area is fixed, then the height is always given by area divided by the width. So the perimeter of this rectangle becomes a function of one variable. Perimeter is 2 times the width plus 2 times the height. Width is x, so 2x plus 2 times a over x. In, if you make common denominators, you'll see that this is 2x squared plus 2a over x. This is a rational function, and it's looking at perimeter of a rectangle when you have a fixed area. Another important rational function we could look at is the logistic growth function. In this function, you have the quotient of a constant and an exponential function, 1 plus n times e to the power negative k x minus a. We saw when we looked at exponential functions, we could use that to represent growth, but ideally, most population growth or any organism that grows, there is a carrying capacity of the environment that the species or organism lives in. So they cannot exponentially grow forever. They grow using something called logistic growth function, which is what you see here. So chemical reactions, carrying capacity of an environment, long-term uninhibited population growth, so many. It appears in neurology, many, many STEM disciplines or look at logistic growth functions. We will look at that a little bit later. All right, let's take a look at what happens when you do arithmetic within a function. All that means is that you are doing arithmetic inside on the input. 
Before, we looked at taking the outputs of two different functions. So that was between functions. Now we're looking at a function and look at inside of its domain or input and see what happens when you do arithmetic there. So before we can talk about it, I want you to play with it. So it's very important to cultivate playfulness. So even though we haven't really discussed this, just take a look at these four examples and find out for all of them what is f of x plus 2, f of x minus 2, f of 2x, f of x over 2, and what changes? Does the domain, the range, what is the effect of doing arithmetic inside on the input? So please try. Remember one thing at a time. Breathe. But please try, even if your initial reaction may be that you don't know what you're saying or you don't know what to do. So go ahead. Just keep breathing one thing at a time and really attempt. See if you can make sense of what these things are. Go ahead. Try it on your own. You can do it. And even if you cannot do it, at least you would know you gave it a try. All right, we'll do the first one together and then see where you are at. So if you've come back, let's take a look. We have our f of x is given in set notation. Input of 2, output is 3. Input of negative 1, output is 5. So all that means is f of 2 is 3 and f of negative 1 is 5. There is only two inputs and two outputs. So we have here, when 2 is our input, our output is 3. When negative 1 is our input, our output is 5. So our function can be written as f of 2 is 3, f of negative 1 is 5. There is nothing else that can produce output of 3 but 2. There is nothing that can produce an output of 5 but negative 1. So what does it mean if I want to look at the function f of x plus 2? What kind of inputs can this function have? Remember, this function is based on the original f of x function that you see here in the orange. So what kind of input should we have x be so that we can produce the same outputs 3 and 5? Well, we would have to have 0 plus 2 is giving us 2. So that would mean that f of 0 plus 2 will give me 3. So input of 0 for this function will produce the output of 3. Can you think of what input x plus 2 we would need so that when you put that here in the new x, that new x, what coordinate should it be so that when you add a 2 to it, you do get the output of 5? Well, it would have to be, good, negative 3. Negative 3 should be our new input. Negative 3 should be our new input so that we end up with plus 2 giving us negative 1 and f of negative 1 is 5. So our input output for f of x plus 2 is going to be 0 is the new input and negative 3 is the new input. Look very carefully what has happened. In the original function, 2 was the input, producing output of 3. But in the new function, f of x plus 2, 0 input produces output of 3. Negative 3 input produces output of 5. So we can characterize that as the f of x domain has shifted left 2 in the new function, f of x plus 2. This is very important to see why this is happening. I'm only pausing here so you can actually see what went on so that you can do the next one. So what do you think happens when you do f of x minus 2? Let's take a look. Remember, here, f of x domain shifted left to so now you have to figure out what happens in f of x minus 2. So again, our original function inputs 2 and negative 1 produce outputs of 3 and 5. So go ahead and figure out what are we going to have input for x 
so that we output are still 3 and 5. So the outputs are not changing when you do arithmetic within a function. But the domain gets shifted or changed. I'm pausing here, so go ahead and you see what to do. So we have here input of 4. 4 minus 2 will produce 2, which will give us output to be 3. If you have input of 1, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, which will give us output of 5. So our new domain is going to have to have 4 and 1 in it. So 4 will produce an output of 3, 1 will produce an output of 5. Look at what has happened between the domain of the original function to domain of the new function f of x minus 2. Remember, the output is the same. Well, the domain got shifted right to. That's exactly what happened here. So we have that the domain shifted right to and the output remained exactly the same. Let's take a look and see what happens to when you have the inputs the same as before f of x, but what happens to it when you look at f of 2x? Go ahead, you figure it out. Pause the video and see what happens. Okay, what is happening here is in order to get 2 as an input, you need to have x to be 1. 2 times 1 is 2. So 1 input will produce output of 3. On the other hand, if you have negative 1 half input, 2 times negative 1 half will give me negative 1. And so that will produce an output of 5. So our new domain is 1 and negative 1 half. 1 will produce output of 3 and negative half will produce output of 5. So you can see how the domain is affected here. Can somebody see what is happening? Instead of 2 and negative 1, we have 1 and negative half. So here, the domain got horizontally compressed in f of 2x. We will look at graphical representation of functions where you actually see the horizontal compression very clearly. I'm highlighting it so you can actually see and remember that when you have input on the inside, what is happening to it? It either shifted left, right, or horizontally compressed when you had a multiplication. So what do you think happens when you have division by 2? Check a look. So instead, we'll have to have 4 over 2, which will give me 2, and negative 2 over 2, which will give me negative 1 as my output would be 5. And negative 2 over 2, which will give me negative 1. Negative 1 input produces output of 5. 2 input produces output of 3. So we have 4, 3, and negative 2, 5 as our coordinates. Or 4 is the new input. Negative 2 is the new input. 4 is the new input producing output of 3. Negative 2 is the new input that produces output of 5. So here, our domain got horizontally stretched by a factor of 2. Hopefully you did problem number 2 attempted on your own. Here it is. Again, f of x plus 2. So we'll have to adjust our domain values so that we can produce the same output. So negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4. f of negative 4 will give me the negative 3, and so on. So look very carefully and see how the input values are adjusted so that we can produce the outputs of negative 3, 2, and 3 quarters. And again, you will see f of x plus 2. What happened? Everything got shifted left to x minus 2 on the inside, shifted everything to the right to f of 2x, everything got horizontally compressed by a factor of 2. Division by 2 got horizontally stretched by a factor of 2. All right, here's the graph of f of x function that is given to you. And we have to figure out what the graph of f of x plus 2 would look like. So we have to figure out what new inputs are allowed so that 
we can create the new graph. So if you look, original input is negative 2. So we may have to plot some coordinates so that we have a sense of what is happening. So we have negative 2, 0. We have 2, 0. And then we have 0, 5. We want to know what happens to these coordinates, just like the previous two examples that we just completed. So in order to get input of negative 2, we will going to have to put negative 4 in. Negative 4 plus 2 will give us negative 2. So let's label our coordinate. If you plug in 0, 0, that's where the 0 plus 2 is 2. So that will produce output of 0. And negative 2 plus 2 will be 0, which will produce output of 5. And so if we connect these, we will see that our new f of x plus 2 graph is going to be the same original shape, but it's shifted to, to the left. Similarly, if you do f of x minus 2, you will have the same graph, but shifted to, to the right. So you can see what is the effect of that. Now let's take a look at what will happen to f of 2x. So you go ahead, pause the video, see what will happen to f of 2x and f of x over 2, and then we'll discuss it together. You can track these same coordinates just like we did the previous examples. Go ahead, try. Don't just wait for my answer. You can do it. So for 2x, f of 2x, did you notice what happened? This is what happened because in order to get 2 times what will give me a negative 2, that will be negative 1. So 2 times negative 1 will give me negative 2. So our new coordinate here is negative 1, 0. 0, 2 times 0 is still 0. So 0 still produces output of 5. And 1 times 2 is 2, so the 1, 0. So this 2 here, this 2, 0 will now become 1, 0. So if you wanted to enter those coordinates, it will really help you understand. I'll just enter one of them just so you can see. So 1, 0 is over here. 2 times 1 is 2, so that's why input of 1 produces output of 0 in f of 2x. All right, go ahead and tell us what happens to f of x over 2. Good. It got horizontally stretched by a factor of 2 because negative 4 over 2 is negative 2. So that will produce a 0. 0 again will give us output of 5 because 0 over 2 is 0. And again, 4 over 2 is 2. So that will produce an output of 0. So this is the graph of f of x over 2. So you can see conclusions are very similar. But in a graphical representation, you can actually see the horizontal stretch and the horizontal compression. All right, here is all the summary of what happened. We have f of x plus 2 graph shifted 2 to the left, f of x minus 2 graph shifted 2 to the right. We had f of 2x, where the graph horizontally shrunk by a factor of 2, and f of x over 2, where the graph got stretched by a factor horizontally by a factor of 2. So the domain of f of x plus 2 stretches negative 4 to 0 domain of f of 2x, negative 1 to 1, f of x minus 2, and 0 to 4, and f of x over 2, negative 4 to 4. So that is a summary of what just happened in the graph. All right, hopefully you've tried the last problem. And you were asked to compute f of x plus 2. So replace x with x plus 2. Remember how to get domain? Domain would be when you take x plus 2 has to be positive, so 0 or more. Solve for x, you get x greater equals negative 2, which will give you domain negative 2 to infinity for f of x plus 2. For x minus 2, same thing. 
f of x minus 2, replace x with x minus 2, x minus 2 greater or equal 0, solve, get x greater or equals 2, which will give you the domain of f of x minus 2, 2 to infinity. f of 2x, that means you want 2x greater or equal 0, so that will be divide both sides by 2, and you'll get x greater or equal 0, so it'll be 0 to infinity, x over 2, x over 2 greater or equal 0, so again 0 to infinity. So that concludes how to do arithmetic within the function, and we'll take a look and see how to do arithmetic using the function values of the same function and what they mean. So that's what we will do in the next part.